Hello again friends, and welcome to the first weekly edition of this thread. Every Friday night I'll be posting a bunch of more stories, feel free to add some of your own. For anyone out there who liked the stories from my old friend Frank, you're in for a treat. I visited him yesterday and got him to spin me a few new yarns that I think you guys will love. This story is one of his, from back before he left commercial diving to be an instructor. Frank was doing a fairly normal job, basic rig inspection on a jackup rig, inspecting the gears and pinions before they moved to the next drill site. The depth was on the extreme end for a jackup rig, just under 600 feet. I say this is extreme for a jackup rig, but that's because it's a portable rig with legs that sit on the bottom of the seafloor, so it can't drill as deep as a floating rig. As Frank was doing the inspection, he felt something like a long rope brush the top of his head. He twisted around and saw what he describes as the biggest squid he's ever seen in his life, floating aimlessly in the current. The body was massive with ears near its head and nearly a dozen long, thin tentacles that stretched down so far you lost sight of them in the gloom. Frank stared at it a bit, both in awe and fear. I did some research and he was never in any danger, this particular type of squid is likely passive and uses its long tentacles to feed on plankton. One thing that is odd is the depth at which the squid was at, bigfin squid are normally found at much lower depths. Frank watched the squid for a few minutes as it floated nearby, then turned back to his inspection. After a few minutes he looked back and it was gone. He looked all around but he couldn't find a trace of it. That species of squid are rarely seen and little is known of them, but they have never been observed to move at high speeds. You might want to sit out this next one if you have a combined phobia of the deep sea and spiders. Now, spiders aren't the sort of thing you think that you'd encounter in the ocean. I know there are aquatic spider species but those usually are very small and live in ponds. Spiders aren't something you'd think to see at say, the bottom of the ocean. Well I'm here to inform you that sea spiders absolutely do exist. They're mostly harmless, but then again so are most land spiders. They're long, gangly things that are all legs with two grasping arms and a proboscis for sucking up their prey's insides. Not supposed to get any bigger than about two feet diameter. And I say not supposed to because lots of strange things seem to happen at the bottom of the ocean. Our intrepid diver in this story was after some sunken treasure and had just dove to investigate what he hoped was an undiscovered wreck that he'd spotted on sonar. He descended to the bottom but to his dismay, the wreck was simply a strange rock formation on the bottom. Disappointed, he prepared to ascend. Just as he checked his dive computer he noticed something out of the corner of his eye a massive wall of sand approaching from behind him. Underwater sandstorms aren't anything unusual, they're just like sandstorms above water except significantly more wet. It's just currents stirring up sediments and throwing them around. Our friend managed to grab onto a rock and hold his position steady as the current slowly faded, leaving only murky waters filled with sediment. Letting go of the rock, he turned upward and came face to face with a large barracuda impaled on the end of a long transparent tube. The tube stretched up and vanished into the murk visibility was below 10 feet. Now the diver was getting spooked, so he went back down to the bottom and swam along the ocean floor for a while to bypass whatever had skewered the fish. That's when he nearly ran face first into its leg. According to his description the leg was skinny proportionately but still about a quarter of a foot in diameter, and it stretched up into the murk beyond above him. He stared up at it for a few seconds, then it began to ever so slowly move, gripping the ocean floor as it moved the rest of the mass that must have hung suspended above, hidden in the murk. The thing moving spooked our friendly treasure hunter enough for him to probably break a couple Olympic records in his mad dash swim to safety. Fortunately he retained enough sense to wait at his safety stops, 
though I can hardly blame him for being scared after seeing a giant underwater spider. This next story is one of mine. It's a bit mundane, as far as the stories in these threads usually go. Nothing supernatural or unknown at all, just a normal dive with some normal sea life. You might have noticed the fish that got so unfortunately skewered by a giant sea spider in my last story was a barracuda. And you guessed it the story is about barracuda. They have a really bad reputation which granted is somewhat warranted. They can get big, around 7 feet long, they have a mouthful of giant razor sharp teeth that can shred through flesh like knives and they have a tendency to hunt in massive packs. Oh, and there are all sorts of stories of people getting mauled by them. The truth is, barracuda have been somewhat maligned by the media and rumor mill. They rarely attack humans. Most cases of attacks are due to the fish mistaking a shiny dangling object like a necklace or bracelet for food, or spear fishermen trying to wrestle their catch away from an uncooperative fish. Of course, those are all the rationalizations I was running through my head when a pack of six foot long barracuda began shadowing me on a nighttime dive. Why was I diving at night, you might ask, why the fuck would any sane man do that I don't have an answer to that question, other than that I think anyone who has ever dove to the bottom of the ocean as part of their job is probably a little bit crazy. I spotted their eyes first with my flashlight, silver gleaming dots in the distance. I immediately switched off my light and went dark for a bit, hoping they wouldn't notice me. Because the last thing you want when you are swimming alone deep in the ocean late at night is to get noticed by a pack of large predatory fish. After a few minutes I turned on my light again and almost chid myself when I saw the very big eye and the also very big teeth of one of the barracuda right next to me. And yet, they're not supposed to hunt humans. But that didn't make me feel any better. These things were big, mean as hell looking killing machines. And if they decided that I was lunch for whatever reason, I would be lunch. There's no getting away from a pack of 6 feet silver torpedoes with razor sharp teeth. So I very slowly and carefully turned around and headed back up, having decided I'd seen enough of the ocean for that night. My escorts tagged along, all 8 of them. They never harmed me, and I'm not sure why they were following me. Could have been pure curiosity. I've had lots of fish swim by to check out my light when I'm diving welding underwater. Not really the typical story I post here, but it was a very spooky experience for me, to be followed by these very large deep sea predators. This next story isn't from a diver, rather a guy who was working on one of those big cruise vacation ships. It was the tail end of the trip, and most of the passengers were either drinking or asleep. This guy was a cook and had finished his shift, he was just relaxing on deck and watching the glowing dolphins swimming through the water beside the ship. If that threw you for a loop, there's this type of plankton that glows when it moves, creating this mesmerizing glow around any moving objects nearby. It's cool as fuck and I would highly recommend anyone interested in the sea take a vacation to a place that has glowing beaches, it's cool as fuck and also very romantic. Explanation aside, our intrepid cook was sitting out on the railing, watching the dolphins leave glowing trails through the water beside the boat. It's the sort of thing that makes working at sea worth all the boredom and loneliness worth it. Unfortunately after a few minutes, the dolphins left and the chef was left alone with his thoughts. Which is when he noticed that there was now something else swimming alongside the boat. Whatever it was, it was big. He couldn't see the shape too clearly because it was a fair ways below the surface, but the glowing plankton gave him a rough view of the outline. He described it as long, serpentine in shape and at least a hundred feet long if not longer. He watched it follow the ship for a ways before it dove further down out of sight. Continuing on with the themes of lights underwater, I have another story from the same cook. There's not much to this one but I think it's still interesting. 
he claimed to have seen on multiple occasions, inexplicable glowing light coming from below the ocean. Different colors, sometimes glowing red, green or yellow. He described it as something completely different from the glowing plankton. The lights would appear and disappear, sometimes they would blink or flash. Some of them would remain in place, others would follow the ship or move in erratic patterns. Once he got close enough to get a better look and saw a glowing orb floating just above the ocean's surface which then shot away from the boat at extremely high speeds. I've heard of similar things from lots of sailors and I've never heard of a satisfactory scientific explanation. So much about the sea, even on the surface still remains unknown. Last story for now before I have to leave for a bit. This is another one from Frank, and it's a good one. During his time as a commercial diver on the west coast, Frank made a friend. And with friends like this, who needs enemies Frank first met his friend while doing a basic maintenance checkup on the local marina. He was checking on the moorings to make sure they were in good condition when he noticed something strange. One of the mooring chains appeared to be sticking straight out of a large rock on the ocean floor. Frank moved in to take a look, and sure enough the chain was somehow embedded in this rock. Perplexed, Frank felt around where the chain entered the rock and noticed something even stranger. The rock felt distinctly unlike a rock. In fact, it felt very softy and squishy. And it was looking at him. The color of the rock suddenly flashed to white and then the entire thing vanished in a cloud of dark ink. You might have guessed it at this point, but Frank's friend is a Pacific giant octopus. They can weigh around 600 pounds and if measured from tentacle to tentacle can grow to over 30 feet in diameter. They also have the ability to change the color of every cell in their body, allowing them to mimic nearly any object on the seafloor. They're big, next to invisible and can be very, very smart. So it was fortunate for Frank that this particular octopus who he named Frederick was just a prankster and not a serial killer. Like some reports of giant octopus I've heard. Over the next few months, Frank would encounter Frederick on various dives, imitating some strange object, flashing white upon being discovered and swimming away in a cloud of ink. After a while Frank simply assumed that anything strange he saw was just Frederick playing a prank on him and ignore him, which would lead to Frederick tickling the back of his head while he wasn't looking or playing with the valves on his equipment. After being ignored one too many times, Frederick turned off Frank's oxygen regulator briefly before turning it back on. After that, Frank made sure not to ignore him and would occasionally bring toys or things down from the surface for him to play with. This odd relationship continued for most of the year until about January, where Frederick disappeared for several weeks. Frank said that he was relieved but I think he worried about what had happened to his friend. Frank eventually found him at the same marina he had first seen him, wrapped around the chain and disguised as a rock. His skills of disguise seemed to have gotten dull, as the rock looked distinctly unrock-like and was covered in strange white spots. Frank waved hello, his customary greeting to Frederick, and after a pause, Frederick waved back. He flashed white briefly, then changed back into the color of a rock. Frank hung around for a while, but Frederick didn't seem to be interested in playing hide-and-seek or any other games, so he went back to his inspection. After a week of half expecting to spot Frederick somewhere on one of his dives, Frank returned to the marina. Frederick was still there, wrapped around a chain. He was no longer disguised as a rock, and his skin was a bright red mottled with white spots. He waved at Frank, flashed white and then turned back red. Frank had brought some fish with him, but Frederick refused to eat or move, staying anchored around the mooring chain. Frank came back the next day with a lobster, which was apparently Frederick's favorite food. He was still there, hugging the mooring chain. 
he refused to eat the lobster and didn't wave to Frank or Flash White like he usually did. The next day, he was gone. Frank came back once a week for the next month before finally giving up on seeing him there again. Sometimes still, Frank will inspect strange rocks or objects he sees underwater, in hopes of seeing Frederick one last time. You can find lots of things at the bottom of the ocean. A friend isn't usually one of them. That s so crazy. Did Fred die or was he dying and then went somewhere to die wow. Imagine this being living there, self-aware, wondering why it has this amazing intelligence, observing life, seeing a human being, playing tricks, etc. And then finally, saying goodbye. I don't know anything about this stuff but it turning red etc sounds like he was dying and losing control over his body the story is so sad. Octopus typically die soon after they mate, the females remain alive long enough for them to guat the eggs but males develop a form of dementia and stop eating right after mating is over. Their body basically self-destructs and consumes itself for energy until death occurs. Giant Pacific octopuses are semelparous, they breed once before death. After reproduction, they enter a stage called senescence, which involves obvious changes in behavior and appearance, including a reduced appetite, retraction of skin around the eyes giving them a more pronounced appearance, increased activity in uncoordinated patterns, and white lesions all over the body. While the duration of this stage is variable, it typically lasts about one to two months. Death is typically attributed to starvation, as the females stop hunting and instead protect their eggs, males often spend more time in the open, making them more likely to be preyed upon. Fred became a dad. F. Have sex. Die. Would you announce do it? Okay, I'm back. Got two more stories for those of you still hanging around. These are from the same treasure hunter guy who told me the story about the giant sea spider. He was deep out at sea, scanning the seafloor in an area known for shipwrecks to see if he could find anything. He'd been doing it for most of the day with no success. He turned away from the screen for a second to look at something else and looked back barely in time to catch the tail end of an absolutely massive blip on the sonar disappearing from the scan radius. Never got an exact measurement out of him, but it was too big and too fast to be a whale. Right after this, he hears something strange coming from the ship's starboard side, and looks up to see a massive rogue wave bearing down on his boat. He barely had enough time to turn into it and avoid being capsized, and a bunch of his stuff got soaked or washed overboard. Apparently the sea was completely calm, barely a cloud in the sky and no wind at all. One for this week, but I saved one of the best for last. Again, this story comes from our intrepid treasure hunter. I'm going to call him Carl from now on just to make writing these a bit easier on myself. Carl was a week into his two-week treasure hunting voyage vacation. So far, he'd had little success and today wasn't any better. It was getting near lunch and so far all he'd done is sit around drinking beer and watching his sonar. Finally, he spots something that piques his interest. A long, pole-shaped object jutting out of the ocean floor and propped against some sort of large rock outcrop. More often than not, Carl says that stuff like this on sonar ends up being just an old waterlogged tree that sunk to the bottom, but there's always the chance that it's the mast of a long sunk ship that was shattered by undersea currents, its treasures and artifacts spread along the seafloor. Hoping for a much needed win, Carl prepped his gear and dove. The descent was uneventful, visibility good, and he was able to spot the wreck from a good distance away. He became more and more convinced that it was a wreck the closer he got, and his excitement grew. Finally reaching the spot, he discovered that the beam was in fact jutting out of the rock rather than leaning against it. The rock was weathered and covered in dead coral and barnacles along with the mast, 
but the shape was distinctly similar to the hull of a large ship. An intact hull means intact treasure, and Carl eagerly began to search for an entry point so he could investigate the interior. After a few minutes of searching, he couldn't find a single hole or break in the coral-encrusted exterior of the wreck. Which is a bit odd, given that the ship had sank. Carl almost gave up hope, until he came across something extremely strange. There was a door, perfectly preserved sitting embedded in the side of the hull. Carl's first instinct was to open it, but out of nowhere every single one of his instincts started screaming alarm bells at him. He hadn't seen a single fish or sign of life on or near the wreck. The wreck was old too old for there to be a perfectly preserved modern door complete with unrusted brass handle in the side of the hull. He pulled back and took another, closer look at the wreck, as a heavy sense of dread began to overtake him. He found a patch of the mast where the coral crust had fallen away and revealed the true surface. After knocking on it a few times, Carl realized that the mast wasn't made out of wood it was stone. If the entire wreck was petrified, it was very, very old. Much too old to make any sense. And much, much too old for there to be a completely preserved modern door in the side of the hull. Who the hell puts a door in the side of their ship's hull anyway? The sense of dread Carl was fearing became overpowering. Every single one of his senses was screaming at him that he shouldn't be here, that he didn't belong, that something was very, very wrong. But there was no way he would just come all the way out here, make the discovery of a lifetime and just leave. So he swallowed his fear and headed back towards the door. He wasn't going to let nerves take what was possibly one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the century away from him. As he swam around the hull to the section containing the door, the fear intensified until as he described it felt like I was having a complete mental breakdown. Still though, he pushed through his fear and towards the door. As it came into sight, he noticed something was wrong, the door was ajar, and slowly opening from the inside. Carl sat there for what must have been a few full seconds, watching the door open, his entire body screaming at him to run. That was when he felt something else. Something watching him, from inside the door. Something that Carl could only describe as pure, unthinkable evil. Carl made a mad dash for the surface, hyperventilating and screaming into his mask, not daring to look back as he could feel a presence following behind him, watching with hungry eyes. He shot straight to the surface without any safety stops, flopped onto his boat, headed it back towards land at full speed and managed to call the Coast Guard for help, despite being racked with pain from decompression sickness. He was picked up off his ship in a helicopter and flown to the nearest decompression chamber. Thanks to the quick rescue Carl survived, albeit with permanent joint damage and some paralysis in his left leg that put an end to his treasure hunting career. He refused to share the location of the wreck with me. Some things on the bottom of the ocean aren't meant to be found. <laughs>